world, the world's writers will walk through those gates. And uh, if you hang around, you get a chance to talk to them. I'm interested in conversations that deal with things that matter, that real, you know, how do we live our lives? First of all, make climate change personal in your life. The second step is get angry and get active. And the third step, and believe it or not, I think this is the most important. We have to imagine this world that we want to hurry towards. But kindness is looking at people as people and not as, I voted this, I do this, whatever it is. There are some people we will never get along with, but most of us, most of us are a complex mass of different things. Hello, I'm Julia Donaldson. Some of you might know me from some of the books I've written, such as The Gruffalo or What the Ladybird Heard. Well, one of the things that I really love normally about coming to the Edinburgh International Book Festival is meeting children who love to read and bringing my stories to life for them on the stage. This year, of course, none of the authors or illustrators can do that. But I am delighted that this year's online book festival is available and free to so many children in so many different places. So I hope that anyone watching has a wonderful time and that it makes you want to read lots and lots of books. Hi everyone, I'm Rashmi and I am so excited to be here today to talk to you about DOSH. Um, now this book um, is illustrated by Adam Hayes and depending on where you are in the world, it might be called Cash, but here in the UK it's called DOSH and it is all about money and how to earn it, save it, spend it, grow it and give it. So we will be talking about all of these things because that's what you're here to hear about and that is what I am here to talk about. So let's get started. Okay. So first, a little bit about me and why I wrote this book. Um, so you can see in the top left hand corner there, a picture of little me when I was four years old. Now I loved telling stories like many four year olds do. And like many four year olds, most of the stories I told back then were completely made up. Um, now today, about half of my stories are made up. Half of my books are fiction and half of my books are non-fiction or factual books about things that are real and true like Dosh. But I wasn't always a children's writer. I started out as a lawyer. I worked in the city, I traveled the world, um, and I loved my job, but I gave it up to find something more creative and flexible and something where I could make a difference. So off I went to business school to try and find out what that might be. Um, I worked with a bunch of startups, which are really, really young and exciting businesses. I even set up my own business with a friend, um, but things didn't quite work out, and that happens sometimes, um, and we shut that down. But the good news is that after all of that, I finally found the job of my dreams, which is, of course, writing for children, um, which is great because I get to write. I love writing and I get to write children's books, which are basically, as you know, the best books there are. 
Now I wrote DOSH because while all of this was happening, I was also growing up. And growing up, I realized that no one really teaches us very much about money. And money is this important thing that we all have to deal with. It's the thing that pays for a safe place for us to live and call our home. It's the thing that pays for the food that we eat, the clothes that we wear, and all the little extras that we might want in life. Now, at the moment, you probably have a grown-up or a set of grown-ups that help look after those things for you, which is great. But one day, that's going to be your job. So I thought, wouldn't it be great to have some kind of a cheat sheet or a manual, a handbook that would help us figure out how to make more money and what to do with it when you do. And that is how DOSH was born. So that's Adam Hayes, the illustrator again. And here's what we're going to cover. Now there is a lot of stuff in this book. So this is gonna be the quickest whiz around the book, just a little sneak peek into what we've got in there. We're gonna look at what money is, we'll look at how to earn it, how to spend it, how to save it, grow it, and most importantly, I think, how to give it away. And giving is so important to me. Money gets such a bad rep, and understandably, because money is used to do some really bad things in the world. Greed has caused so much suffering in the world. But I really wanted to show that there's a good side to money too, and that if it's used well, it can actually be a real force for good and a force for change. So Josh, what is it? What do you think of when you think about money? If you hear the word money, what comes to mind? Wads of notes, maybe coins, um, maybe you think of people paying for things with a bank card or a credit card, or even with their phone. But money wasn't always like that. So way back, and I mean way, way back, people used to barter. They, you know, if you needed something, then you'd have to swap something for it. If you needed some food, you would need to give something up in order to get it. And that's called bartering. Um, and how much you gave up, or what you gave up would depend on what the other person wanted, and how much you gave up would depend on how badly they wanted it. Um, and bartering actually still happens in the world today in some places, and it happens in some situations. If you have ever, ever, ever swapped anything with a friend or with a sibling, then you have been bartering too. But back then, um, people often bartered with things like livestock or um, grains and vegetables, but it just wasn't very practical because livestock, well, tricky to carry around um, and grains and vegetables can rot. So we needed something that was more practical, um, just, you know, something that everyone could accept. So people started to use things that look a bit more like the coins that we use today and started off with things like shells, but then you started to see coins made out of different metals. Um, notes took longer, paper money, that started in China, and it took a long time to be picked up around the world, but eventually it did take off because they were such a good way um, of representing larger amounts of money rather than lugging around loads and loads of coins. And money kept evolving. Um, we've got things like bank cards and credit cards. Some of them have contactless technology, so you can literally just tap to pay, um, and you can even pay with your phone nowadays. Um, now, all of this is about making money easier and easier to handle, easier to use, but there is a dangerous side to this, because a lot of people feel like when you tap to pay, um, it doesn't even feel like you're spending money. So you have to be really careful. It's not like counting coins where you know how much you've got left. So it's something to watch out for. And there are new types of currency too. So cryptocurrency um, is a very new type of money. You might have heard of Bitcoin, for example. Now, cryptocurrency, the crypto means encrypted, means that it's protected by code, so it's supposed to be super secure. And this type of money is completely virtual. It's designed to be used online. It's a bit like money in a game, um, except that it's real and it can be used to buy and sell real things. And we don't have much time to go into it here, but one very famous type of cryptocurrency is called Bitcoin. Now, some people are really excited about it, some people are not so sure about it, but it's something you'll have to make your own mind up about. How to earn money, right? So you've seen what money is, how do you get hold of it? Now, unless you've got a genie in a lamp, and if you have, you probably wouldn't be watching this event at all, you are going to have to earn money if you want to get hold of more of it. You're gonna to have to work for it. And that basically means trading your time and your energy and your skills for money. 
Now, maybe you already get some kind of pocket money or allowance at home. Uh, maybe you've got a chance to earn a bit of extra cash by doing some odd jobs. Um, or maybe you don't. And the truth is, you know, it's not possible for everyone. When I was growing up, um, my parents couldn't afford to give me extra pocket money or anything like that. So if that's your situation at home, it's okay. Um, be kind and be patient. There are plenty of opportunities to make money later in life. But if you do have a chance to earn some cash at home, um, the thing to think about is what do people need and what do you have to give? And this is like the basics of business, really. Um, when there's something that someone needs that matches up with something that you have to give, there may be an opportunity to make some money as long as they are willing to pay for it. And that bit is actually really important. So you may be amazing at gaming, okay? You may wipe the floor with absolutely everyone, but it's highly unlikely that someone is going to pay you to do that at home. Now, later in life, there are jobs that involve gaming and they sound fantastic, um, but that's for later. You're also unlikely to get paid to do something that you're supposed to be doing anyway. So, for example, your homework um, or brushing your teeth twice a day, because you should be doing those things. No one's going to pay you to do them. Sorry. Um, you need to be thinking about doing something a little bit extra. So that is money today. What about money tomorrow in the future? Tell me something, has anyone ever asked you what you want to be when you grow up? I used to get asked this question all the time, all the time. Grown-ups love it. But sometimes when someone asks you that question, you might just be, you know, a little bit, you might just be a little bit like, what? You know, what on earth does that even mean? Um, you might not have thought very much about it. It might be something that's really confusing. That question can put a lot of pressure on you to find one dream job or one career. And actually some people might end up having several jobs over the course of their life, like me. Um, and there are lots and lots of things that you can do to earn money. Whatever it is that you're interested in, I promise you there will be something out there for you. There is a dream job that's out there waiting for you. It is a question of figuring out what you like, what you enjoy, what excites you and interests you. You can think about what you're good at or what you can get better at. It doesn't need to be something you're good at today. Um, you know, and if you find something that you are good at or can get better at that other people find difficult, then you might really be onto something. And if you think about it, there's so much choice in terms of jobs today, but there will be even more choice tomorrow. By the time you get out of school, there will be some jobs out there that don't even exist at the moment. Things like um, being a 3D printed food chef. Um, who knows, something to do with drones, a recycling engineer who takes recycling and turns it into something wonderful. And um, there are so many things that don't even exist at the moment. The world is changing. So the best thing that you can do when you're thinking about earning money in the future is to get ready for change. And the best way to do that, I think, is learning how to learn. Now you might be thinking, what on earth does she mean, learning how to learn? What I mean is, you need to become a boss at learning new things. Everyone learns differently. Things that work for you might not work for me. If you know what works for you, then you will be able to pick things up faster and there'll be more things that you can learn and more doors that will open for you. And there are also some other skills that you can collect that will help you no matter what you end up doing in life. Skills like these ones here. Um, now these are useful, whatever you end up doing, it's a good idea to collect as many of them as you can. Or I'd actually say collect them all, because why not? We've got things like adapting to change, because things do change and you need to be quite flexible. Things like teamwork, everything, I mean, almost everything in the world takes teamwork nowadays. It's very rare that you'll be working on your own always. You know, making a book like this um, took a massive team. It's just how the world is. Creativity, again, it applies to absolutely everything, thinking about things differently, critical thinking, questioning things, you know, examining whether there's a better way to do something. Emotional intelligence is such an important one, um, but understanding emotions, other people's, but also your own and knowing what to do with them. Decision making as well, sometimes that's under pressure. But sometimes it's not, but it's about being logical and having an approach, weighing up the pros and cons and figuring out what the best course of action is. 
Now it says fixing mistakes there, but what I really mean is being able to make mistakes, being okay with making mistakes. I'm sure I'm gonna make a lot of those today as well. They're making mistakes and being able to carry on learning from them and doing something better next time is just such an important skill no matter what you end up doing. Now, if you can collect these, if you can work on these, you might find that they help you make even more money, whatever it is you end up doing in the future. And they're also really useful if you decide to set up your own business. Because we've been talking about job jobs, but you might decide to actually set up a business of your own. Um, and if you do, again, um, just like thinking about odd jobs at home, you start by thinking about what people need. A lot of people think business is starting with a business idea, but really it's about starting with the customer, thinking about what they need, what you have to give, um, what's their problem, who's solving it at the moment, what could you do better? So you think about that, come up with an idea, test it with your customer, and then make it better, test it, make it better. And if you keep doing that, you will end up with some very, very happy customers. Here is one person who did just that. This is Mo Bridges. Um, Mo Bridges um, set up his handcrafted bow tie business when he was just nine years old. Um, it's called Mo's Bows and he did so well. He set this up because there were people out there like him who just couldn't find bow ties that matched their pers his amazing personality. Um, as you can see, these bow ties are just so colorful. So he set up shop um, on his grandma's kitchen table um, and started making these bow ties. And he did well over time, he started selling, he got into some stores, and then in 2017, he actually got a one year contract to make bow ties for 30 basketball teams in the NBA in the USA. It was incredible. Maybe you will come up with a business idea like that one day. I've got lots of ideas in this book, and I'm sure you will come up with more of your own as well. So that's how you make money. How do you spend it? Um, I'm sure this is something that you know all about, or do you? Let's have a look. So spending money is all about choices. Suppose you go to an ice cream parlor and you've got two pounds, and it's two pounds a scoop. Now, you're gonna have to pick a flavor. If you pick the chocolate, you can't have the vanilla. If you have the vanilla, you can't have the chocolate. Spending is about choices. And if there are things that you're saving up for, then you're going to have to factor those in too. Do I buy this two pounds ice cream now or do I put that two pounds towards my savings goal? Well, we'll come back to that. As well as choices, spending is about priorities. And that means listing things in order of how important they are. Some things are just more important than others. And you have to figure out what's more important to you. It's really personal. The first thing to do is to figure out whether something is a need or a want. So just looking at the things on the screen right now, maybe you can figure out which of these things are more like needs and which of them probably wants that you don't really need but would be nice to have. And yes, I'm sure you figured out all the stuff on the left, the food, water, clothes to wear, somewhere to live, those are needs. Um, and on the right, things like nice trainers, game console, or you know, phone, cinema tickets. They're nice, but they're wants. Um, now, as I said, today, someone's probably taken care of all of these things for you, which is wonderful. But one day, that'll be you. So it's really good to be able to get used to identifying what wants and needs are you know, from now. And once you have figured out your needs and wants and your priorities, you can start to make a budget. A budget is just a fancy word for a grand plan um, for what you can do with your money. And what you do is you take all of your money coming in and you record that. Money coming in might be things like pocket money or allowance money if you get some. Um, it might be birthday money if someone's given you some birthday money, prize money if you've won some lately. All of that goes in money in. Then you think about money out. These are the things you're going to be spending on. And it's a really good idea to be able to put your savings in here too. It's a good idea to get into the habit of just putting a little bit away um, as savings.
things, and this is part of your money out. Now, everyone's situation is different. Maybe you're only putting away a tiny amount. It might just be pennies to start with, and that is absolutely fine. The main thing is getting into the habit of saving. If you can make that a habit today, it becomes so much easier down the line. And the key is to make sure that the money coming in is more than the money coming out, or at least the same because you're counting your savings. And if you have extra, you can save it or you can give it away. It's up to you. Either way, you are winning. Now, when you do come to spending your money, you want to spend it right. So that means looking out for tricksy advertising, because there's a lot of that around. And adverts are designed to make you want things. They're even designed to make you think that a want is actually a need. Think about chocolate ads. Okay? They make everything sound so yummy and creamy and wonderful and dreamy. And you see all of these happy people having fun. And of course, you're not silly enough to fall for all that, right? But we do all the time, all of us. Um, because adverts just seep into your brain somehow. And before you know it, you start to really, really want things or even need them. So watch out for that. Another thing to watch out for um, are these special offers. You might have seen some of these, especially special offers that are not really very special. Buy one, get one free, half price. Um, and my favorite of them all is when it's gone, it's gone. The closing down sale. We all, we've all seen these closing down sales. I had one near me when I was growing up um, where the shop was closing down for about two years. They kept counting down to zero. They closed down over the weekends and it felt like they were open, having a sale again. It was just the most bizarre thing. But it makes you want to buy because you don't want to miss out on things. It's amazing and it works. The reason it works is because our brains are designed to take shortcuts. They're designed to make decisions quicker and easier for us. So if we see a jacket that says 50% off, half price, well, that sounds amazing. We think that's such a good deal. It's a bargain 50% off. But what we should be asking is, do we really need this jacket? Is the jacket worth 50, whatever the price is? Is it worth that price? And is it worth that price to me? The trick is, whenever you're in a situation thinking about buying something, to stop and to think. And I'm not just saying this to you, I'm actually saying this to me as well. The thing to do, you stop, you think, and you ask yourself, do I really need this? You know, having said that, um, look, once you've taken care of your needs um, and you're doing some thinking about the future, you're being sensible about this, you're budgeting, you're planning, of course you can splash out on things once in a while. You know, I'm not saying you can never do that. I'm not a monster. But if there is something special that you have your eye on, then you might need to save up in order to get it. So how are we going to do that? How do we save money? Question for you. Where do you put your savings? A, in a cookie jar. B, in somewhere like the sock drawer stuffed into a mattress or in the freezer. Seriously, I've heard that people actually put money in the freezer. C, in a money box or a piggy bank. Or D, in the bank. What do you think? The answer is, of course, D. Your savings should go in the bank. Now, of course, you probably have um, a bit of cash with you, but most of your savings go in the bank because your money is safe there. That's what it's designed to do. It's safe from you, as you don't spend it all, and it's safe from other people too. There's actually a story of a lady in Israel who stuffed $1 million into her mattress. This is how the story goes. Um, and her daughter had no idea. She came along, did a spring clean, and chucked the mattress away. And they spent ages trying to look for it at this landfill site, um, but they, they couldn't. Um, and apparently that lady lost all that money. So the story goes. Um, so keep your money in a bank. The other thing about banks is that they actually pay you interest. That is free money that they pay you in order to keep your money with them. And they do that because they are also using that money to lend out to people who need to borrow it. Um, and they're charging those borrowers interest too. So that's how banks make money. And they pay you a little bit of interest to keep your money with them. And that's how you make money. Now, interest rates are really, really low in the UK right now. So it's not going to be tons of cash. Um, sorry, but it is something. And there is another thing that can give your money a power up, um, and that is compound interest. Um, and there's some complex maths behind it, which we don't need to understand. But the thing you need to know is that when you save money and you don't take it out, you can benefit from a kind of snowball effect. 
It's like rolling a snowball down the hill. It picks up more and more snow and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. That's what compound interest does. You add on the interest, you save it, you get more interest, more interest. And over time, and this is important, time gives compound interest a power up. Over time, you can make more money. It's not a get rich quick scheme though. It really does take quite a long time. And there is also a dangerous side to all of this, a dark side, and that is that it applies to borrowing too. So remember we said that when you borrow money, you pay interest? Well, if you don't manage to keep on top of those payments, then that money can snowball too, and suddenly you can find yourself owing quite a lot. Now, borrowing is completely normal. Many, many of us have to do it, and you may have to do it at some point in your life too. The thing to do is to try and budget and keep on top of your payments, um, and if, that's difficult and things are getting out of control, um, never be afraid to ask for some help. And actually, I think that applies to everything in life. Another thing that's worth mentioning is keeping some kind of an RO fund. This is an emergency fund, um, which I hope you never ever need to use, but it's a good habit to start early putting some money away for this. To get into the habit, so later on it's just something natural that you always do, like brushing your teeth. Um, and we do this because you never know when things can change. Um, things can happen all of a sudden, can happen to any one of us, and you might need some emergency money tucked away. So it's a good habit to get into. Um, savings, you know, again, it's a habit. Um, once you get into the habit of this, then you will always look at new spending in terms of your savings goals. Um, if you're saving up for some shoes and you have a chance to spend some money going out to the cinema with some popcorn and so on, you will start to think in terms of, you know, do I really need this? Or could I have a movie night at home and put that money towards my trainers? Um, you know, looking for places where you can save money. And you might be able to do this as a family too. You know, you might be able to um, talk about things that you can save money on at home. Maybe you could do a taste test on branded foods and supermarket versions to see what you really prefer, because um, the cheaper one might even be better. Um, you can plan your meals to save money, cook more at home, use energy saving light bulbs, turn the lights off when you leave a room, come up with free things to do, um, do some research to find those things. You know, there are all kinds of things that you can do at home to save money. Now, saving money is one way of growing it, but as we said, it's quite slow. But there are other things that you can do too, like investing your money. Um, and, you know, it's not a get rich quick thing. Again, it takes a lot of luck and, um, you know, it's not that easy, but it is an option. There's not much time to talk about these things. There's much more in the book, I'm sorry, but I'm going to give you a quick whiz of one investment option. And that is something you might have heard about. Shares, investing in shares. So suppose you have a bit of cash. One thing you might do is invest in a share of say a chocolate company. Um, I talk a lot about chocolate. That is because I did write this book when I was very, very hungry. So sorry about that. If you buy a share in a chocolate company, then when that company does well, they will often share parts of their profits out with their shareholders. Um, they'll have loads of shareholders, so this will be a tiny amount, but over time that can add up for you. Another thing that happens is when the company does well, you can find that lots of people want to buy shares in the company. And when lots of people want something, it pushes the price up. So the value of your shares goes up. And if you ever want to sell that share, you'll get more money for it. But the flip side is also true. If the chocolate factory does not do well, and you can see the chocolate factory, the picture here, all crumbling, thunderstorms abound, if that happens, then you might find that the company's not making very much money, they're not paying out profits, and in fact, everyone's selling their shares, which makes them worth less, and your further value of your shares goes down. So it's a very sad day for you, and this happens. And I always say that, you know, investing is risky. Um, it's a bit like standing on some wobbly jelly. And some jellies are just wobblier than others. And that's true with investments too. Um, you know, some investments are, are just riskier than others, but they are all risky. So you should only invest money that you can afford to lose. You don't invest money that you need for expenses. You definitely don't invest money from your uh oh fund. And a top tip is to never put all your eggs in one basket. Make sure you spread your investments out. If you're investing in chocolate, Maybe you also invest in the opposite. I don't know, what's that? Toothpaste? Toothbrushes? Who knows? 
Um, and there are other types of investments too. Um, we've looked at shares and there are more in the book. Um, there are lots of other things you can invest in. Some of the fun ones are things like art, um, antiques, property, and commodities like gold. But whatever you invest in when the time comes, I know this is for later, be careful. There is no magical way of making money because if there was, then we would all be millionaires, wouldn't we? It's just something you really need to think about and always, always do your research. And you're gonna need a lot of luck too. It's something to be aware of. Okay, the best bit, how to give it. Now, of course, you should have money to meet all of your needs and more besides, and you should be able to do all the fun extra things that you've always wanted to do with money. But imagine the good that you can do with it too, the difference that it might be able to make in the world. I think that's something really special. Now, you don't need me to tell you that there is a lot of inequality and injustice out there. But the good news is there are so many charities and organizations that are working to make the world a better place. And you can help them by giving them some money. And there are all kinds of things to support. Um, the thing to do is to decide um, what causes matter the most to you. And what do you care about? What makes you angry? What do you want to change in the world? Um, there are charities and organisations that work on environmental issues. There are ones that work on things like protecting the environment, helping the homeless, um, helping the elderly, uh, making sure that people have food, making sure they have somewhere safe to sleep, um, you know, making sure everyone has an education. It depends on what you care about. There are all kinds of things and what you support is entirely up to you. Another way um, that you can give, and I would still call it giving, um, is by paying your taxes. Um, and when you grow up and you get your dream job um, or you set up your dream business, when you start earning money, you will have to pay taxes. And if you get a job, these will go automatically. And if you have a business, then you will need to tell the government how much you're earning so that you can pay the right amount in tax. And the way to understand this is you think of the money that you earn like a chocolate cake. Yes, it's chocolate again. Imagine that money you earn is a chocolate cake, then the money that you keep, um, you can't keep all of that, you're going to keep the entire cake, um, you are going to give a slice of that cake to the government as tax. And if your cake is tiny, um, you don't have to give anything at all, because that's only fair. And if your cake is huge, then you are going to give away a bigger slice than if your cake was just medium sized. And that's how the tax system works. And where does that money go? Well, tax money is used to help the government build and maintain roads, um, hospitals, schools, parks, libraries. Um, it makes things like the emergency services possible. And it means that we all get to enjoy these things and benefit from these things, no matter who we are, and even if we don't make very much money ourselves. So when you're older, pay your taxes because they make such a huge difference to the community that we live in. Another thing that you can do to make a difference um, is by spending your money with good companies. Uh, so spending can be a way of giving too. And that means spending with companies who treat their workers and growers fairly, um, ones that maybe share out their profits with good causes, ones that solve social problems. You know, you could shop from charity shops, another thing you can do. Um, or when you do your weekly shop, you can also donate some money or some of that food to a food bank. So there are lots of things that you can do um, it to give that isn't just giving to charity. Another thing you can do is work for a company that is a good company and does good in the world. Or if you set up a business, set up a business that does good in the world. All of these things are different ways of giving. And when you don't even have much money to give, there's one thing that you can always give, and that is your time and your support. You can speak out about things that you care about and believe in. So there are so many ways of giving. But whatever you decide to do, do it your way. It really is your choice. Giving should be a really joyful thing that comes from you. No one should ever make you feel guilty about how you do it, why you do it, or how much you give. Right. So that was really, really quick tour of everything in the book. Um, I've got some questions from you, which I'm going to find here. Um, just a moment. These have been sent in earlier, so I'm going to answer a couple of them. So, number one, 
Why can the government not simply print more money in an economic crisis like we have now with coronavirus? That's a really good question. The reason the government can't just print lots of money is because if there is lots and lots of money in the system, it won't be worth as much. Because remember, things that are rare, like say diamonds, tend to be worth more because they're rare. If you have lots of something about, its worth goes down. And then what will happen is prices will have to go up because you're going to need even more in order to pay for a simple little thing. And in some countries, this has gone completely out of control in the past. So it's not really something the government can do. And that's actually why you have a central bank like the Bank of England controlling how much money is in the system. Next question, what jobs could I do to earn pocket money? So we talked a little bit about this, but I think it's really individual. It's gonna depend on how your house is set up because you will have things that you're expected to do. Um, and it's a good idea to sit down and think about what those things are and look at the things that you're not expected to do, things that other people in the house might do that you could help with. If you can free up their time, make their life easier, um, they might be willing to part with some cash for that. But remember, it's not always possible for everyone. It's not something everyone wants to do. Um, so do check first whether that's something that's um, even an option. Okay. Next question is, is money related to gold? Um, that's a really good question. Well, gold is in a way a form of a store of wealth. It's, it's, uh, it's something that people invest in um, and it's worth a lot so people tend to invest hoping that it's going to be worth more in time but it's just not very practical as a form of money to use every day is it like you're not going to pop down the shops um, with a bar of gold it's just just never going to work um, so it's one of those things today we think of as a commodity to invest in um, where does money go after you spend it? I love this one. I just love the idea of thinking about where a coin might end up. Imagine you go to the shops and you spend something um, and that money might be given to another customer as change later that day. And then maybe later on, um, that money will be spent on a bus or at the zoo or goodness knows where. And it's gonna go off on a journey of its own. Maybe it'll end up in a bank account where that money will then be used to pay someone's wages. So who knows? I wish someone would do a kind of documentary following a coin for a couple of weeks. I think it would be amazing. Um, and another question, um, what is money made out of? Okay, um, I had to look this up actually for you because I didn't know what kinds of metals. Um, so just as an example, um, one and two P coins are made of copper plated steel and silver five P and 10 P coins are made of plated steel. Um, pound coins made of nickel brass and nickel plated alloy and you know, and so on. These are all different types of metals. Banknotes um, are made of a special paper but the newest banknotes printed by the Bank of England are actually made of a polymer, um, which is a special super thin and flexible type of plastic. So I learned something too, thank you. Next question, who invented money? Um, it's a great question, but it's very difficult to answer because money has always been evolving. Um, money started out as bartering, as you know, in so many forms all over the world. I think one of the oldest forms was recorded in ancient Egypt. Um, then you've got shells in places like India and China. Um, you had the first coins, some of the first coins that were minted in the kingdom of Lydia, and that's now Turkey. Um, paper money, as I said, came from China. So all over the place, and I don't think you can pin it down to one inventor or one place that it was invented. It's fascinating. Um, and I'm gonna ask, uh, answer one more question because we're running out of time. Um, and this is fantastic, isn't it? How, do you, how can you save a million pounds? Um, I'm sure that's a question in many of our hearts, um, but I'm gonna focus on the saving part of it because everyone listening here is gonna have a different savings goal. It might not be a million pounds, but whatever your goal is, I would say that the absolute best advice that I could give is to start really early. The earlier that you start saving, the earlier you get into the habit of saving, the more all of that adds up over time. It's not a form of magic. It is just how the world of money works. So 
Um, I think that's all that we've got time for. Um, we've covered lots and lots of things, and there's more in the book too. Um, we've looked at what money is, how to earn it, how to spend it, save it, grow it, and give it away. And I hope that you manage to do all of those things. And whatever you do in life, I wish you every success. So thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have the most fantastic day. Thank you. Bye. Well done, Rashmi. Oh, gosh, thank you. <laughs>